Thank you that very yeah. much, Tony Newman, for joining me. It's terrific to meet you. I've had I so do. many requests um, for from listeners wanting to hear from you. So I hope you don't mind taking us for a little walk down memory lane to where it all started for you. Oh, I don't mind at all. Thank you for asking me. I'm oh, that's surprised. A yeah, I'm surprised anybody's really interested. In See, because a lot of it seems like ancient history to me, you know. Well, that, that's what we specialise here in a, in a breath of fresh air: <laughs> ancient history that that all the oldies like you and me remember very fondly and want to relive. So it's terrific, okay. terrific to have the opportunity to chat with you. Thanks for your time. So, what's a good Englishman doing living in Las Vegas? <laughs> Oh, that's a long story. Man, that's a really long story. Uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to go back to when I was with T-Rex, uh, which was, uh, I don't know, 77, 78, something like that. And I got a call that Mark Boland had been killed in a car crash. And it was a real shame because we were doing very well. He'd got the new band together, uh, the new T-Rex. Uh, we were voted best new band, believe it or not, by the listeners and, uh, and watchers. And uh, we were doing concerts. And it was like a resurgence of what it used to be years ago. You know, I mean, it was it was exciting. Everywhere was sold out. And so to get this call that, that my dear friend Mark, uh, we became great friends. Uh, we really, we touched each other's hearts from the beginning. And... Um, uh, I got this call that he'd uh, he died, and uh, that was it. And uh, I was having a really bad time in London with alcohol and drugs, and I'm getting getting a divorce from my wife, and I'm living with this gal in London. It was just an awful damn time. It was a real bottom to me. So my buddy uh, Herbie Flowers, who'd uh, introduced me to Mark, uh, suggested I go to Nashville. Well, you know, I I'd never ever been to Nashville. I think we oh we did stop there with Bowie once, and the Wings came. Paul McCartney came out a party, but apart from that, I don't know anything about it. But I thought, well, I need a break from it all, from me, you know, mainly. <laughs> so I took this trip to Nashville, and I had I got booked straight away to play sessions. And I'd never played country and Western music. I didn't have a clue. And so we got on this session and I'm I'm listening to music and I didn't know what to do. I mean, it was too simple for me. And uh, all of a sudden the guitarist started to bang his foot in time and I sort of followed on and uh, uh, went on from there, you know, and uh, had a pretty successful career in, in Vegas, ending up with, uh, the last uh, account I had was with the Everly Brothers, and uh, I worked out of Nashville for that. And I I got divorced and I got married again and uh, got sober, which is a miracle, and I had no money. I remember that. It was just about scraping through. And my wife at the time had a house in Vegas, so I thought, well, we need to, I need to get out of here. I want to go out west. So we, that's how we came out in Las Vegas and uh, started again and doing great, living in a nice home now. And uh, we're, t we're both retired. And uh, I mean, I listen to music all the time and I'm talking to people all the time about music. And, uh, you know, because when I first started, I was in, um, I lived in a really weird part of London. It was about 30 minutes on the train to the West End. And uh, I was about, oh, I don't know, 13 or something. And I got myself, I got a paper round and I, I made enough money on it to buy a kit of drums. So I went into this store in London and I said to the guy, I want that kit. He said, all right, well, it's gonna cost X amount. I think it was like 13 pounds for everything, which is like 20 bucks. So it was a fortune for me, you know. And uh, so he, I said, well, I can't afford this. And so he said, well, you know, we can put it on higher purchase. You can pay for it over time. So I got, a, I got this drum kit. Well, the guy in the store, we got the drums together. He offered me a gig straight away. So we need a drummer for this big band. So by the mere fact, that I'd uh, 
I bought a drum kit, I got a gig, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the truth of the matter was, uh, I did these gigs in and around London, and uh, uh, I didn't really know how to play drums. You know, I was, I'd was i gone to the jazz clubs, and I'd seen, like, Phil Seaman play, who Ginger, Ginger Baker, worked with Phil. Phil was a heroin addict, and I loved him. He had a... He's had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He talked to me, you know, he was great to me, you know. And uh, so uh, Ginger was his student. And Ginger at the time was a uh, registered drug addict. And uh, But the guys like Graham Bond and, and the guys in the bands he was working with got him straightened out. He got him straightened out somewhat, somewhat. And so I'm talking to Phil Seaman and... Uh, working in a factory as an engineer and flipping burgers at night, you know, because uh, I had to make money. You know, I used to like to drink, party, and rock and roll all the time, you know, and never <laughs> need money. You know, so I got this audition to work in a band, which was uh, ultimately became Sounds Incorporated. So uh, when I was with Sounds, we... Um, we were doing these gigs at the weekend in Leytonstone and a talent scout came one night. Uh, his name was Henry, Henry Henroyd. And he was a, he was an ex-boxer, a very, mm -hmm. very gaunt face. And he worked for Don Arden. So he said, look, boys, he said, uh, would you like a gig with Gene Vincent? So we're thinking, man, this is the big time. Bebop Alula and American and... This is what I want to do. You know, I got the fever about rock and roll when um, I, I saw this poster on a bombed out building uh, in London and they had a hit parade on it. I'd never seen a hit parade before, top 10, you know. And number one was Lucille, Little Richard. And so I went to a fun fair and got on one of these rides, fast rides, and that was it. Like they played. Uh, Lucille, and it put shivers <laughs> up my spine. You were it intoxicated. Was, oh, it was the injection I needed. You know, to hell with it all. I'm going to be a rock and roll drummer. So yeah. I end up with. Uh, so I end up with. Well, Sounds Tony, Tony, let me let me just stop you for one second. How did yeah. you manage to get the audition for Sounds Incorporated? I asked. I answered an ad in the Melody Maker. Oh, yeah. uh, it wasn't Sounds Incorporated at the time. It was. Um, Brian Bentley and the Bachelors. And uh, they made recordings actually, but this is very early, you know, 1960. So I they asked me to come down and audition. So I mean my mates took me down to the rehearsal room and uh there was about five other drummers there and uh and I just got up and played and I, I never dreamt that I'd ever get it and they picked me. And, you know, I'd never done an audition. I, I didn't know much. I, I, I played completely by feel of what I heard. Uh, the only technique I had was speed and triplets and fast stuff. And they, at that time, you know, the drummers were putting an edge on it. Uh, you know, you can hear, if you listen to Stevie Wonder, Fingertips, when he was like 16, you know, and and the drummer there just gives him a big kick up the arse sort of massive fill. And I thought, that's it. That's the way I like really on the edge, all the time on the edge, you know. So was so drumming was 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 uh, was drumming more important then than it is today? Well, you know, I love drums and drumming, but I I, I I'm I can't play anymore. You know, I'm 79. You know, my I have three sons that play. Uh, one's professional in Na in uh, London, actually. Yeah, Richard, he I know. Worked, yeah, he does really well, actually. But what what I meant to, what I meant though was was the was the presence of a drummer was the inclusion of a drummer more important in the '60s to a band than than the part that it plays in today's music. I don't know. I don't know. There's some great bands. There's, you know, I see the drums are featured a lot with the rap artists, you know, the, 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 the and uh, there's some fantastic uh, uh, gospel drummers. I mean, they're just out of this world. The, the fills they play and what they do and the sound of the drums. And uh, that's what I love. I, 
But in but yeah. in those early in those early days in the sixties, a drummer was really all important. It was partly because of the time it was. But yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we all really wanted it badly. We all wanted to play, you know. And uh, I must have wanted it more than anyone else because I was successful at it. Right. You know, I really was. I had a, all those years, you know, I worked with sounds and open for the Beatles at Shea Stadium. Well, I want to, and I, I want to talk to you about all of this. Tell me, okay. what was it? What was it like playing with Sounds? That was your first professional band that you were with. What was that like for you? Well, that was outrageous, you know, because we worked with Vincent G. Vincent. We drove all the way up north of England, and some lady that knew us gave us a cake in case we got hungry. You know, it's like a six-hour drive, seven-hour drive. So, so we get to the gig, and uh, here we are, and uh, we play a set, and then the guy uh, uh, introduces Gene, and like this maniac comes on dressed in dressed in black, you know, black leather. You know, his face all stretched up and he's looking at the stars, you know. And we just maxed out. You just did. We played rock and roll. I mean, just the guys are all working on moves in the band. It was like a real rock and roll band. I mean, we got into it, moving the saxes everywhere, guys laying on their back. And we get off and the place is going crazy, you know. And <laughs> I'm asked for my autograph and uh, sweating, you know. I mean... <laughs> It was it was something else. It really Tony, was. Tony, Tony, what's what's point me to one track from Sounds that really represents that? Well, uh, with Sounds, it's difficult to pick a singular track because uh, you know we were we we didn't have any original material. We were copying what what uh, the American acts were doing, and we were doing it our way. So with sounds, uh, there was a, there's a track called "On the Brink," and that is sort of a good rock and roll track. It's later. One of the guys from Manfred Man wrote it, and it's like it's it's a pretty pretty good track, you know. Awesome, that's great. So from sounds, you you mentioned you actually opened for the Beatles in in 1965 yeah, that, at Shea Stadium in New York. Yeah, Tell us about that. That was it. Well, we were with Sounds, and we, uh, sorry, we were with the Beatles and we toured with them too. We met them in Hamburg. We were with R Little Richard in Hamburg, and they were in there in the Star Club. They were doing four sets a night or something, along with the Searchers and Jerry, not Jerry the Paceworks, all these Liverpool bands that we all became friends with. We loved it, you know, a lot of heavy drinking, a lot of sex. You know, we're in the red light district. <laughs> Kids, you know, giving us speed and have what you like. You know, the club, <laughs> the club's drug of choice was preludin, prelis, and because uh, that meant that all the sets were fast. Everyone's playing quick. You know, <laughs> George Harrison talks about it. Prelis, you know. So um, uh, bro, uh, the Beatles really liked us, and we liked them. And of course, we worked with like couple of people they really, really liked, like Little Richard. No one ever dreamt in, in our era that they'd get to meet or play with Little Richard. There he is, you know. It just it was a big deal, you know. So so uh, we get back to England. Uh, we, we worked in America once in 63. We did an exchange deal with Johnny and the Hurricanes, and it was um, – uh, an English band had to go to America and play exactly the same gig for the same money as what an American band did in uh, England. So Johnny and the Hurricanes went, and of course we didn't get paid like them. And but that club we worked at loved us, and it was sold out. So they were going to open on Sundays and Mondays to facilitate the crowd, and they offered us a partnership to stay. Of course we couldn't, you know, we had we had a manager in England and. That. So anyway, where was I? So um, back to working with. So we, Brian Epstein signed us uh, to back primarily uh, Scylla Black. You know, we would be Scylla's backing band. And we were a good opening act for the Beatles because we had saxophones and we weren't anything like them. So we opened Shea Stadium with them. Yeah. I mean, it was incredibly noisy and. Uh, they didn't, the PA system was ridiculous. It was like six Voice of America speakers facing the crowd and 
I don't know whether we had monitors or anything, but I mean, everything was a slap back. So you had to guess where you were time-wise and, you know, just blank it all out and go through it. And uh, so, so we you, were for... So, I mean, were there, were there screaming girls while you were playing too? Could you hear yourselves play? Could they hear you play? I don't know. I mean, we played and the screaming never stopped. And the bass player said to me on the way, he said, I don't know whether they're screaming because they liked us or they're screaming that we're off so they can see the Beatles. <laughs> you know, so the Beatles went on and uh, we did the whole of that tour. You know, we did uh, the, uh, what's the Los Angeles, LA, oh, well, I can't think. It's like a shell, a uh, famous gig. We did that in Houston, Africa Dome. And, uh, uh, when I was in Houston, I had like white jeans and a white t-shirt. So I went up on the parapet to look down on the stage, you know. So with that, a, a, a chief of police comes with six of his deputies and surround me. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'll work here. And I went to walk away. And they all pulled their guns out and pointed them at me. I mean, six deputies. And he realised, you know, I'm unarmed, for God's sake. I haven't got anything on, T-shirt, jeans. And he said, I'm sorry about that. But it was crazy to have six pistols pointed at you before the show, by the way. So, uh, what, you know, What did they was... thought you'd done wrong? Nothing. They're paranoid. Anybody out of place, they're going to get shot, you know. That's America. It's America. <laughs> it's just crazy, you know. I, I feel sorry for them, shot. though. They must have had an immensely difficult time controlling the crowd in those days um, for acts like the Beatles. Oh, they'd never seen anything like it. That's right. You know, never. Never had there been it. I mean, the Beatles were revolutionary. They were great. And I used to use Ringo's drums every night, and they'd put a Sounds Incorporated uh, badge on the front, you know, of his drums. And, uh, and Ringo had a special case made up for him. I don't forget, we had these traps cases which held the snare drum and the, the, some of the symbols and the stands, some of it. And it had Ringo style the Beatles from Ludwig Drums, you know. Mm. And I thought that, that was the first time I'd ever seen a, somebody get endorsed by a big drum company. You know, it was a really great deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that must have been an incredibly special time for you with those guys. Well, it was. It was. Uh, I, it was a bittersweet thing because, although it exposed us, we didn't have any music to present to the public that that was that was appropriate for the time. I mean, we were like robots on the end. You know, we just go on and play our set like robots and. I don't know why it was nobody thought, why don't we write some cool stuff or get someone to write cool stuff or get a singer and mellow it out somewhere. It was so frantic. It was ridiculous. So like, let's play as fast as we can. Then you'll like us if we get off quickly, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the mad things that go on in your head, you know. And, uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, we, we did those tours. And I left. I can't remember when I left. 65 or 66 and I, I, uh, I left them to do sessions. My wife at the time was a big, big session singer. She, she'd do three or four sessions a day and she'd work with all the Motown acts. I rather like Sounds did actually, because we backed Little Richard and Sam Cooke and uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Benny King and the Shirelles. I mean, we had a roster of acts that we worked with, and the American acts really liked us because we learned the material before they got got there. So they come in, and we got it down for them, you know. Uh, what, an so we, what an incredible time in music it was back oh, then, yeah. particularly in, in the UK. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tony Newman, you then went on. Um, share the story around, around uh, meeting and playing with Donovan. Well, I was with the Jeff Beck group. It's, now, I'll tell you this story, just set it up a bit. Great. Uh, I was a session man, and Cliff Richard had sort of got me on as his main drummer. I was the man that played the live shows. I'm the man who does his recordings. And 
I was doing a gospel tour with him, of all things, you know, with a, band, a group called a folk band called The Settlers, and uh, I'm playing brushes, I'm not playing drums. And uh, it was a good account that, you know, I was glad, of, I was always worked. And uh, Jeff Beck called me one night and he said, he said, we need a drummer. He said, I remember playing with you at uh, Hammersmith Palace on the Beatles Christmas show. We, we, the Yardbirds were on, you know. So he said, uh, could you come down and play some tunes with us, you know? So again, I'm, I'm going to a uh, audition that I didn't know. I thought we were going to cut some. So Rod's there, uh, Jeff, and Nicky Hopkins is playing piano. And I don't know who the bass player was. Uh, no one actually knew who he was. <laughs> he was a ringing. <laughs> so he, so and they offered me the gig. I got the gig straight away. Come on, let's go to America and tour. Let's make some records. So we made, uh, so the bass player lasted one night in America. And that was it. And then Ronnie Wood came in and played bass. And Ronnie was great, a great bass player. So Ronnie and I went back to, the band went back to England and uh, we did uh, Donovan. We did uh, Goo Goo Barabba Jangle and something else and a couple of other tracks with Donovan. And it was Donovan with, with the Jeff Beck group. So they were good tracks. They really were good tracks. What was he like to work I, with? I don't know. I mean, we just went and cut music. And you, just put the, you just put the music down well, and put I mean, the vocals on? He was singing. No, he was there. But we were too busy figuring out what to do with the arrangement to really talk to him. I mean, I don't know whether I talked to him or not because I was so involved in, like, making the rhythms interesting and getting sounds right, what we're going to do and make the feel sort of interesting. And yeah. You did pretty well. The, uh, yes, awesome we did. Tracks. Yeah, yeah, they are. I like them too, which is <laughs> rare. And, and you know what's amazing about them is that those sort of tracks, I mean, actually a lot of the music that you've been involved with holds up still pretty well today. Well, that's what I'm told. It really does. You know, Jeff, see, we all got fired from the Jeff Beck group on a, we were, oh, that's right. We were in New York and the album was 18 in the US charts, Becola, you know, um, and it wasn't, it was supposed to be Cosa Nostra Becola, but Peter Grant wouldn't let us do that uh, because of Costa Rola, the, the alliance with the Mafia, who were running the show anyway. So uh, we get to go, get up to go to like Woodstock or something. And Jeff's not around. Jeff's gone back to England to sort out his girlfriend who's screwing the gardener or something. So really, that was it. That was it. I worked with him for about a year. Then I told him that it was over. He called me and said, I'm getting a new band together with uh, Tim Bo Beck, Bogart and a piece, you know. And that's what happened. So we got fired. And... Uh, for, and um, Later on, I saw Jeff had remixed a uh, Becola, which I played on, and he noted he was really sorry about getting rid of that band. He said, I made a big mistake there. So how does that feel for you? I mean, one minute you're part of a band that's really flying high, and the next minute it's like, I'll oh, see you later, don't need you anymore. Well, that's showbiz, you know. I mean, that's the worst part, you know. It, sort of, it hurts you, but you get used to it. There's so much disappointment in... Uh, showbiz and so much uh, uh, crooked business with the artists. They do what they could do then. They could manipulate me any way they wanted to because i am got a record in the charts with the Jeff Beck group. We're moving up. We're gonna, it's going to be big, you know. And so, oh, don't pay me. If you need to pay me, that's all right. But, you know, so we're dumb, just dumb asses, you know. Yeah. And uh, I remember we did call a strike at... Uh, in New York with Jeff Beck Group, and they had to pay us uh, $5,000 a piece to play the Shape of Beer Festival. And the lawyers brought the checks down and paid us, and uh, we got paid what we were due, you know. Good job. <laughs> well <Yeah>. done <laughs> sticking up for yourselves. Yeah, I know, I know. Crazy, really. I was the instigator. It's us against the mafia. I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know, when I think back on it.
Yeah, but certainly better than being constantly ripped off and promised money oh, that you're never going to see. I know, all the time. Went on all the time. That's awful. Awful. Yeah, it is. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I, I don't believe that still. I don't believe that still happens today, but it certainly was very prevalent then in those days, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I don't know how gullible these bands are these days, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I sure if you, up... I'm sure if you spoke to your son, you'd find he wasn't gullible. And and he was he had a bit of a business brain about him. I think they've all learnt from from the past. Well, I hope so. But you know, you don't know. I mean, I hear show you know music stories all the time. Like a very big act, I won't name him, went back on the road on a stadium tour and wanted the wanted to pay the brass section what he'd paid them in the early seventies. And not only that, if they cut a, a, a CD, they wouldn't get paid for it. I mean, come on, what are you doing, you know? Come what on, Tony, grief. just between me and you, name him. Well, that was Cliff Richard a few years ago. Wow. I couldn't believe it. Wow. I just, I, somebody came and told me, I said, listen to this one. Oh, I was with the Everly Brothers and the guys, a couple of guys lived in London and they were, part of the, I guess it was the early, late 90s, early 2000s, you know. It's just mind-blowing. Why don't you just pay the guys? Unbelievable. And it wasn't yeah. like he wasn't making money. Unbelievable. No, I know. And Mr. Spiritual, you know. Yeah, that's right. And moving forward, after uh, after you fired from Jeff Beck's group, um, not too long after that, you meet David Bowie and join him yeah. on, uh, on Diamond Dogs in 1974. How'd that come about? Yeah. Well, uh, there's a few groups in between that. Beck was like 70. Then I had my own band called May Blitz, which was a stoned out band that we <laughs> became. That, it sort of became cultish. People really like it for cult, cult memories. And actually, a strange thing happened about six months ago. Excuse me. Six months ago, I was talking to the A&R man at... at um, Pearl Drums, who I, I endorsed Pearl's Drums. They were very good to me, they're great drums, and they always took good care of me. So I'm talking to the A&R man, and he said, um, he said, I'm going to Italy, he said, and I really hope I get your second album that you recorded with May Blitz. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's the head of Pearl Drums, which blew me away, <laughs> you know. The stoned out drummer I was then. You know. Amazing. I haven't heard of that band. Give us a point us. Oh, shush, my dog. Point, it, point us to your favorite track that may blist you. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Put, uh, put Squeet up. S Q U S Q U E E T. Okay. There's we'll a lot. There's a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a live album, um, which is great. You know, it's something else. Uh, Live from, oh, I love my mind. Anyway, don't, check don't out worry. a live, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I definitely will. But um, that band I'll didn't really, it. that band really didn't find commercial success. It was more of a cult status. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, it did as long as it ran its course, so we couldn't afford to run it anymore. And then I was with Chris Spedding for a while, guitarist. And then I got a record deal with uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, to work in a band called Three Man Army. And so that was the Gervitz brothers. And uh, I, was do I was doing sessions at the while, uh, while I was working with them, while I was under contract to Warner Brothers. And I was working with The Who, doing some tracks for the movie Tommy. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I get a call. I'm at, I'm at the studio and I get a call from Herbie Flowers, and he says to me, you've got to come over here. I'm working with David Bowie. We can't get this right. We've had several drummers come in, and it's not right. Will you come over? So I said, well, you know, I'll, get, I can, I'll finish here in an hour. I'll get over there by maybe 9 or 10 at night. So we went over, and we start cutting, and David just loved it. You know, it's, uh, it's Mike Garson on piano, Herbie on bass, and me just playing drums and David singing to us. And uh, he loved it. He was just, uh, loved what I did. And we got on great. And then after a few days, he 
said to me, do you want to come on a tour with me? I said, that sounds great. You know, I'd love to. So uh, very graciously, Warner Brothers let me out of my Warner Brothers contract. And actually, Ginger ba Baker did the gig. He, it was the Baker Gerbitz Army it turned into. And I was with David. So that was oh, that. How amazing. Yeah. And, and yeah. what was it like with him? Because that was at the, at the peak of his career. He just exploded onto the scene, hadn't he? And he was so very different for those times. He was just blowing people's minds everywhere. <sighs> I know he was. And the band, you know, we went to New York and we rehearsed. And uh, the rehearsals were great. David had the dancers and the band in. And it was a great vibe, you know, we're going to go do shows and that. And then somehow it got very theatrical when he was like taking Broadway on the road. So we got all of a sudden David, the group singer, as it were, came David, the megastar. So it all changed. It all changed. We were then... I don't want to say rele relegated, but we sort of are. So a back, back, back. We, you know, we're we're at the back of the stage, and these, all these massive theatrics are going. Arms are coming out, and and uh, you know, we we had a percussionist who was great, and El Slick on guitar, David Sanborn on saxophone, and Richie Garando on baritone, and uh, two or three background singers, and it was a really, really good band. I mean, really good band. So we're sold out everywhere, but I don't know what the audience thought because we're playing like it's not even fusion. It's trans something, whatever, you know. Because <laughs> David, you know, when I got in the studio with him, we're going to do a track called Sweet Thing. So I said, what do you want me to do, David? You know, he said, I want you to imagine that you're a French drummer watching your first guillotine. What? Yeah, so that was <laughs> that was the that was the drums on Sweet Thing. That's so bizarre. Oh, isn't it? It isn't. So it turned out some people think it's his most passionate track ever. They really like the live version. See the live version of all that stuff. Is really good because we've moved away from recording, way, way beyond recording. You know, we're now adding all the nuances that we always wanted to do and, and give it up and kick up the arse. Let's have this rocket, you know, no messing around. Let's, let's get it on. This is what we're here for. So that was the attitude, you know. And David had added a MD uh, called Michael Kamen and uh, a... a Oh, I watched a girl was on piano, uh, Mike Garson, who was brilliant. And uh, so Herbie Flowers and I have got an attitude immediately. You know, we're the featured artist from London. We're not taking any fucking notice of what he says for a start, <laughs> you know. You can stick that where the sun don't shine. You know, so this poor MD's trying to do this stuff. It's totally ignored, you know. And we became great friends. We really did. So I'm I'm chatting with Tony Newman of multiple bands who were specialisers in the drums. Um, Tony, you said that David Bowie became the star and it all got really theatrical and the band receded into the background. How does that feel for a band? Because, I mean, each of you are, are, are stars in your own right and you're being pushed right back to make room for this, this big feature singer out front. Did it bug you? No, it diminishes the ego performance somewhat. And maybe that's a good thing because it all stays within like a session groove. You know, so he his backing was just perfect. There weren't any massive solos where people are flying all over the stage. It was a show. It was a Broadway show. And we were the band. So we're, we're all object professionals. You know, you can't have a turn, an ego turn uh, about that. You just get on with it. That's what you're paid to do. Right. So that's Herbie and I and Slip. But the band all, we all did the gig. We all just did the gig. Everybody. And how long did that tour last with him? 
Oh, I don't know. Uh, two or three months, I suppose. And then um, my ex-wife, it was a really strange time, had gone nuts in London. And they didn't know what the hell was about with her. And she was, she had my daughter who was like a year old with her. And she'd gone nuts. She couldn't, she had these glazed eyes. So I get this call, you Margot's gone nuts. We don't know what to do. So I flew back to London, I took a, uh, flew over there one day, got a hold of her, took her to the uh, American embassy, got a visa, got back on a plane, and got her to New York, and put her up in the hotel, and I went to work. And when I came back, I couldn't find her. She wasn't in the bedroom or the living room anywhere. And so, uh, God, it was a weird time. And I eventually found her in the bath eating soap. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, with my daughter there. So I got hold of John Lennon's psychiatrist and I took her up the road to him. And when he saw her, he said, look, she needs to go into a sanitarium straight away. He said, I'll give you some pills. He said, but I don't think it'll work, you know, with her. So she wouldn't take the pills, obviously, so I, I mickeyed them. And she took two and she sort of came around. But I then had her and my daughter on the road, and my son, my young son, with her I had a two, wife and two kids on the road. And it wasn't too bad because I'm not out rocking and rolling club and we're doing shows every night or every other night. But uh, the cocaine use was <laughs> absolutely insane on that tour. Just insane. The David was like, he looked like a death camp victim. He was so gone, you know, he had weighed nothing. And that was his lot, that was his gig, you know. And, so constantly uh, wired. Oh, all of us. Well, I know I was out for the, you know, maxed out. And not and, eating uh, very much either. I don't know what the hell we were doing. I mean, we did a live gig. We did all live gigs. We did a two day recording in Philadelphia. So my nose is so packed with cocaine, I can't breathe. You know, it's just blocked up with cocaine. And I can't believe we're going to do a live recording here. I mean, I get on stage and I have no idea what to do. You know, I'm like an autopilot. So we do it. And then the next night, apparently, there were, I didn't know this, but there were two nights recording. I found out later, I thought we'd done one. So I never wanted to listen to the album. I thought, I'm not listening to the way I played on there. That's terrible. I mean, and he puts it out and it does very well. And then they, um, they remix it. And my son calls me from England. He says, you've got to listen to David live. It's something else. So I listen to it and it's really good. And again, I look at the liner notes and David said, you know, we had a lot of leakage from the singers and the guitarists and piano players because of the volume. And we had to overdub some of the voices and the, some of the keyboards and some of the guitar, you know. So the only thing we didn't touch were perfect both nights were the drums. <laughs> so you can do it right no matter what your condition, huh? Well, I don't, I'm sober now, so I could never <laughs> And get him back there again. I mean, you know? all, all those drugs, I mean, that was just par for the course, wasn't it? It I mean, was, if, yeah. It if, was. You, if you were going to be part of the camaraderie of it all and, and and you know, one of the boys, you had to do all of that whether you wanted to or not. Well, that's right. We make drug, drug addicts out of straight people, you know. I, don't, I never saw Mike Garson do any. Uh, I don't know what he did, you know. Oh, he was into Scientology. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that saved him. Yeah, it did. He, he took us to New York, all of us, to see the what the scientific Scientology building, <laughs> and uh, he said, "You'll do really good if you get some routines going." Said, what routines? <laughs> what does that mean? This shit? Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, you know, it's a it's a novel. That's what it is. It's a novel. What are you doing? But that floats your boat. Call to you. You know. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. if you ha if you with the benefit of hindsight, would have you done the same if you had your time again? 
Well, I think, you know, I think there's something about being a freak that gets you into like the higher e echelons of entertainment. And maybe it was because I was so mentally beat up as a kid and then I started drinking and taking drugs. It, it made me do things that I wouldn't have done sober. But, you know, uh, I managed to play for another 25 years without taking a drink or drugs. You know, I didn't, I didn't use at all. And what, I worked was the, with... what was the turning point? Well, that was uh, 1983, and I'm in Nashville, and I'm broke. And I've got my the girl in London who had a baby, a stripper in London had a baby, and I brought her over to Nashville. Oh, I've been talking. I know. <laughs> tell me about it. Tell me about it. And one day I said to my but we were at the Hilton Hotel at the airport, and I've convinced the manager to provide us with all the alcohol we can drink and two sweets. Yes, of course. We've got no money, nothing. And so I've, I've, I've conned him into doing this, and I was going to the bathroom throwing up blood. So was he, and I met past him. We're both covered in blood, going to the bar, ordering another double brandy. And I, when, I, when I came around, I said, well, I can't do this. I'm done. I don't know where the wife and kids are. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's I don't even have a kit of drums to play. I don't know what's happened. So take me to a treatment facility. I, I got to sober up here. So that's what I did. I went to a treatment facility in 1983. And I've had a drink or a, since then. Good for you. Where did all yeah, the money go? What Did you blow all the money on drugs and alcohol? Yeah, I don't know. I, I couldn't. I, I once... When you're in treatment, they ask you to make a budget of how much you're spending a week on alcohol and drugs. So I said it had to be 3000 a month, like $12,000 a month. Wow. Where did the money come from? I don't know. How did I pay for it? I don't know. But, I mean, all those years that you were playing, you've earned good money with all those bands. Yeah, but I spent it all. Sex on drugs, drugs and alcohol. Sex, oh, drugs. I the forgot drugs. the sex, yeah. Yeah, I've got, oh, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Clever Dick here. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's just, just outrageous. That's what I lived on, you know. You're a big star. And I'm not making the money the stars make. I'm making a great living. And I see the guys in the bands buying houses and nice cars, and I'm broke. You know, I, I went... What happened to you last? Oh, I went to Tramps or something. We had a great time. I don't know where I ended up, but, you know, here I am. Yeah, right, right, right. Are you still friendly with Herbie Flowers today? Yeah, he, uh, I haven't spoken to him in years. He's in his mid-80s now. And the last time I spoke to him, oh, I was about 10, 12 years ago, you know. Because, oh, right. uh, you see, so many of the guys I knew uh, are dead, you know, or severely handicapped from being in, in the music business, you know, the you know, the diseases that come over you, or all of a sudden you see these guys doing all the blow and everything, and they're like, Lemmy, you know, don't do what I'm doing, you know, and the next minute he's dead, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how it is. It, it was the same with uh, the Who's play, bass player went the same way, you know, you can't do this. You can't do it. We're too old. Our bodies are wrecked, you know, uh, and uh, we don't. Our bodies don't don't can't cope with the, what we did in those days. Nowhere near. Yeah, I mean, I'm bothered about doing a an aspirin too many because it upsets <laughs> my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> How I, ridiculous. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, it's lucky, it's very lucky that you stopped when you did, or you'd be in the same category, wouldn't you? In the same place. Um yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, and nobody can explain Keith Richard. Well, Keith, yeah, he's he's a picture of Dorian Gray, you know, he's the last of the great rockers. Yeah. You know, I, I went and saw Keith and Roddy when they were playing with the Stones, and we had a great time together. And the first thing Keith said to me was, what the fuck are you doing here? You're supposed to be dead, you know? 
<laughs> years ago. And, and, and dear old Charlie said he was so shocked to see me. Like, you're alive. You know, what the <laughs> hell are you doing here? Keith Richards, amazing. Oh, I love Keith. He's yeah, great, great amazing. Yeah. Um, Tony Newman, the, the reason that I that I got in touch in the first place with you was because I had listeners' requests from people who were totally into T Rex. Oh, and, okay. Um, they're massive Mark Boland fans. So, would yeah. you mind sharing some of the stories and thoughts about the time that you were with Mark and T Rex? Yeah, sure. Well, it was another one of those times when I was in London and I'd lost my drums, I think. The management company had told, took, taken my drums and I'm just sitting in London with this woman doing heroin all day, taking this Dr. Collis Brown Clority. It's for diarrhoea and sickness of, of Victorian laudanum. So, you know, I'm supposed to have three drops and I'm having a whole bottle of it, and glug, glug. And I sat in this flat, not playing, no drums, for about three or four months. And all one day I woke up and I said, I can't do something about this. This is nuts. So I called my friend uh, Herbie. I said, what you got going on? Uh, he said, I don't know, nothing at the moment, but I'll call you if I do. So he, the next thing I know, he called me. He said, look, I'm working with Mark Bowden. He needs a drummer desperately. They, they don't know what they're going to do. I didn't even have a drum kit. So I said, look, rent me a kit and I'll be over there. So I went over there and uh, I dismantled this drum kit and got it sounding pretty good. And, and Mark came up to me. He said, it's been a while for both of us, hasn't it? I said, you ain't kidding. Yeah. So he'd been out on a run or two, I think, for a while. And we were... And uh, I started playing with him and Herbie was bolstering me up in the studio. And he said, this is your guy. Have a listen to this. So I started working with, with Mark and uh, we immediately hit it off, you know, because we both we were both alcoholic drug addicts. We're trying to keep it under wraps somehow. You know, we managed to keep it down and uh, I'd go out on benders, but I always managed to make it to the rehearsals and the shows and the recordings. And uh, he's just a lovely guy, you know. I just loved him. And he'd give me his clothes, his jeeps to Jackie. He says, see if this fits you. And he got me all like his his T Rex like clothes, you know. Mm. And I'd wear them. I'd wear them. We had a we had a great glam rock, but it was good music. He was a good guy. He yeah. played great guitar. I tell you, of all the people I ever went on stage with, Mark Boland had the most charisma. He was just shot out there. It was beautiful to see, and beautiful to be a part of. And you know, he couldn't <laughs> sing, but he could. He's like, bah, you know, uh, but. <laughs> It was crazy, and uh, I remember him singing a track with Silver Black, <laughs> and he starts singing this was like gobshite over it. Or what the hell is what's he doing? You know, ah, yeah. she's doing a little puppet thing, you know. And uh, oh, it's a lovely guy. And uh, was that Gloria track ever was... released? Pum. Was that track oh, ever released? Probably, I've no idea what it's in the answer. I've no <laughs> yeah. idea I'll, what. I'll check it. That. You you obviously had a lot in common with Mark Boland, but I want to know how come you didn't have a drum kit? Where had your drum kit gone? I'd lo I'd lost them. The manager. What do you mean you've I'm, lost it? Well, I had a an agreement. I was with a band called Boxer, who was signed to Virgin, and I was managed by Nigel Thomas, who managed. Everyone he'd managed, he'd managed to damage incredibly. And they'd all got ripped, like Joe, including Joe Connor, and Chris Staten, and everybody, you know, the Grease Band. And so we were with this band called Boxer, and we got an album out, and Virgin really liked it, and they released the wrong tracks completely, and we went to L.A., and the singer, Mike Pato, got cancer. So we're in LA, we haven't done a gig, uh, and Pato's got cancer. So we're seeing him at the at the cancer hospital, and then all of a sudden we're shipped back to London, and we hear that we're no longer going to be boxer, that Ollie Horsall, Keith Ellis and I 
were fired without our equipment. Nothing. Rick Wells was in the band, uh, and we had a great band. And uh, so I just got stoned out there and uh, yet another showbiz disappointment. You know, we're all out of work again. Nowhere to live particularly, you know. My house had been repossessed under Nigel uh, Nigel Thomas's management and my wife and kids were living in a in a rental place out in Reading and I didn't care that much because I'm living with this this lady who took her clothes off in the night and during the day and we're going to fix the world and so that was that I didn't have any drugs wow amazing I mean by the by the time you met Mark Boland um that was already after his um, um, um his first surge of popularity wasn't he because yes, his, yes, sir. his heyday was really 70 to 73 and That's at that right. time he was compared to the Beatles with uh, something like 11 uh, top 10 singles in the charts. I know, I know, it was absolutely fantastic, but we sold out everywhere. Everywhere was packed. I mean, he did really good business and, you know, it was a good band to work with. It really was. It was a really good band. And Herbie thought it was the best band he'd ever been with, ever. He really? thought it was absolutely fantastic, yeah. What, what do you think was, I mean, the band itself, the musicianship, yeah, must have been fabulous. But the music itself, were you into it? Yeah. I mean, I think I just like Mark and his charisma and his his delusional ego, which was just I just loved and laugh. You know, he'd go out. He went out, you see. He just he didn't care, he'd go somewhere else with it. And the mainstream would think, what the hell is he doing? But we went along with it, you know, it was just playing drums with Mark Bowler. It was a great honour, really. You know, I really liked him. He loved me and I loved him. And I was really, yeah. really sorry to see him go. I mean, it broke my heart. Yeah, I can imagine. How had he managed to handle that dip in fame and fortune before resurrecting it? Does that, I, I'd imagine that would, um, I, unless he was just off his face so much that he was impervious to it. Yeah, I don't really know. He, he'd gotten a bad reputation when I when I joined the T Rex company, he you know he they they badmouth him a lot about what he wanted and how much damage he'd done and uh, and I thought that doesn't apply to me. You had that experience. I haven't had that experience, and uh, I really liked him from the off. I thought he had a tremendous amount of car uh, uh, a tremendous amount of talent. And he had a great charisma about him. I mean, that's that's like a spiritual thing to have a charisma. You don't you don't acquire that. You have it, yeah. and you develop it, or it dies. Yeah, and of course, the girls all loved him because he was so good looking. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he wasn't with any strippers. He he could hang out with all the groupies. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, and. Uh, it must the have been plenty of them around. Was, was she a groupie too, you know? Well, she looked well, fantastic. She... <laughs> I was like Marilyn Monroe, you know? Yeah, right. But I, sure. I think I was man number 658, you know, of that week. Yeah. And, and I'm sure with your headspace as it was, that wouldn't have bothered you in the least. But what, what Not was it? in the least. <laughs> and what about all those groupies who used to hang around? I mean, particularly in the Boland days. Well, they're there for after hours entertainment. They'll be who you want them to be. I mean, some of them are really good looking and uh, are quite independent. You know, they just like being with people who like to rock and roll and let it all hang out. You know, they're, they're good little models. You know, they just, they're not interested in the straight dudes that are like, uh, they would acquire with their notoriety, you know. They're not interested. They got their own money. They got their own cars and houses, you know. So some of it can be fairly interesting. A big ego trip, you know. We've all been there, you know. This one thing you do when you're rocking around the world. Did you ever ask yourself, or, or did you ever wonder what the appeal of of the of rock and rollers were to women? And so I'll just do that again. Did you ever ask yourself what the appeal of rock and rollers was to women? 
Yeah, I once asked a girl I was with, what what about me? What's so attractive about me? She said, you're different. It wasn't that you're great looking and you're a good drummer or something. You're different. You know very important people, you know. You can mix in any any company, you know, you're not, you know, which I can, you know, I still can do that. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I can just pick up the phone and call someone and I can do what I like. So if you had it all again, it doesn't sound like you would change a thing. Well, yeah, there are a lot. You've got to remember with all this, there's a tremendous amount of peripheral damage. You know, when it's so selfish and so self-centred and uh, nothing matters more than the drums and Tony Newman, it's not a good thing. It is not a good thing. It's it's on the B side of life, really. Because you see, the one the one thing you will run out of is is a celebrity. But the to seek a spiritual life, you won't run out of a spiritual life. So that's what I try to do. Spiritual life being doing my best to be kind to people and be loving to people, you know. And therefore, I'm kind and much more loving to myself. I don't abuse myself like I used to. I couldn't do all that, what I've just talked about. I'd last five minutes, you know, be dead. Did you try and talk your son out of being a professional drummer? No, I never. Those kids never asked me anything. They just saw what I did and wanted it. I mean, they never asked me what I did or something. You know, they, they got to find their own way. That's their journey, you know. I mean, I, I want to straighten them up drum-wise and... They're not interested. They listen. They like to listen to the records I played. Like my son said, "Listen to a record I lost." And my son, I think, they had uh, a thing I did with David Coverdale, White Snake thing. It was North Winds, and it's really good. You know, it didn't do anything, but the grooves are good, and uh, he's blew him away. So just listen to it. It's absolutely fantastic. You know, like, oh well, glad you like it. You know. They must be pretty proud of you. Yeah, yeah, they are. And I love them dearly. Love them dearly. Tony Newman, what an absolute joy to chat with you. Thank you for sharing your stories. There's definitely more than one book in you. Can we expect a, a book anytime soon? Oh, I've been writing it. It's sitting here. And I write about once every three years a paragraph or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an avid writer, you know. <laughs> I'll get it done. Yeah, it really deserves to be written. You've got some fabulous t stories. What, what it's all a, great. Yeah, a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for sharing time with us. Thank you. All right, thank you, darling. And some friends of mine want me to forward a copy of this podcast how do they do that i will i will send you all the links um yes. when it's edited and up so that you can that you can do that i mean and i will put um i will put some of this interview up onto youtube too but i will send you all the all the links via email so you'll be able to share it wherever you would like to share it there'll be loads of people who were who will just love hearing from you i'm so well, grateful you you're so not much. you're not just... sorry yeah, no, go ahead. I thank you so much. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled by this whole situation. I really am. No, oh, it's wonderful to talk with you. And you're not, you're not married to the stripper today, are you? Oh God, no, no, no. I got a beautiful wife. We've been together. We've been together 31 years and married 26. Good for you. And uh, yeah, we're doing all right. We're really good for you. Doing all right.